Yeah, I just want to say thank you to the Lord um, that he gave me the privilege of, of being here. And I would have said that um, no matter what. But uh, there's no human explanation. This is just my mind. Like, I've lived this life the last five months. Um, and there's no human explanation uh, to me for why I'm standing up and, and doing well physically. Um, I feel better today than I felt on Monday. And um, and so the Lord, like, I think all week long the Lord has been strengthening me physically and um, to do the work that he's, that he's given us to do. So, blessed be God our God. Uh, Psalm chapter 6, if you would. We'll start there. And then if you're, if you're pre planners we'll go to 1 Samuel chapter 14. If you want to be organized and ready to look. Psalm chapter 6. I just want to read... Um, Two and a half verses here. Start in 8b, if you would. Second half of verse number 8. So Psalm 6, second half of verse 8. For the Lord has heard the voice of my weeping. The Lord has heard my supplication. The Lord will receive my prayer. Let all my enemies be ashamed and greatly troubled. Let them turn back and be ashamed suddenly. Father, this is too important to not be um, to not be what you have to be, and so I just want to ask, uh, just in simplicity, that that you would take me as an instrument in your hand, and that you would speak to your people, whether it's your people at the satellite sites. Um, we thank you for technology; it's been a joy to see technology used for the glory of God. Uh, whether it's people that listen on recording later, uh, or whether it's the people sitting in this room, um, Lord, we just want to be very quiet in your presence this morning. And we just ask that you would, in that still, small voice, that you would speak to your people in your omnipotent power. We've been asking you all week to lead us along, and so we ask this morning that you would lead us along for the great glory of Jesus Christ and for the great blessing of the people of God. We ask these things. Thank you. So I read, this, I read these verses, and, and I just think of the word that I've thought of uh, all week long. This word has just been in my head and been in my head and been in my head, and that's confidence. Confidence. Not arrogance, right? Um, boy, as we go home from here, my my biggest prayer, I think, is that we go home in confidence in our great God. Um, I, I, that phrase that we all know of the Apostle Paul, follow me as I follow Christ. I read that. I've read that so many times in my life. Um, and I've read that so many times and thought, I've never said that to people, at least that I remember. Um and I don't think that it's, it's appropriate in a sense. Um, we need to have that, that God-given confidence in our Lord. And we need to have such clear consciences that, that we could say to people in an appropriate way. Again, not arrogance, but in an appropriate way, uh, this is the way the Lord has led me in. And then eagerly invite them, follow me as I follow Christ. This is the greatest path in the world. Would you please come with me as I follow after the Lord? Just confidence, right? Boy, with a God like we have, we can be so we can be so confident. Um, I just want to thank the Lord also for a week. Um, my my evaluation of this week is is this that it was it was, and I'm choosing my words carefully. That this week was perfect. And what I mean by that is not just blind optimism or enthusiasm. I mean it very literally, that it was complete. Um, I, I um, we, we took, um, you can agree with this or disagree with this if you want. We took our kids to Disney World years ago. And my daughter was probably five or six years old. And um, and she just, she just was like this, you know, like um, there were princesses in castles and, um, like she just, I mean, honestly, like her feet barely hit the ground all day long. And um, and she actually said, I feel like I've been floating on a cloud all day, you know. And a princess came out of the side door of the building, walked right up to my little Rebecca, took her by the hand, took her in the back door of the carousel, and rode the carousel with Rebecca. Like you should have seen Rebecca. I mean, just, and and um, this has been me all week long. <laughs> I, I just so... Uh, um, you know, but you know, you want to know why, though, honestly? Um, I know 
on two levels. I know 100% this is where the living God has me. And it is such a joy to be here. And I also know 100% because of Him. I know 100% without any doubt this is where the living God has us. I know that this is the step forward. I've known that for two years. Um, I know that this is the path of following Christ. And it is such a joy to be here. And when I say it's perfect, I, I don't mean that the Lord won't lead us to change anything in the future if He leads us to do this again. Um, I don't mean I, I don't mean a lot of things. What I mean is that this was owned by God. Uh, it was directed by God. I've rejoiced in that all week long. How the, the hymns, by the way, thank you. Uh, if it's appropriate on a human level to say thank you. Thank you for those of you that gave out hymns. I was astounded at, the, at how they flowed with the thoughts from the Word of God. Thank you for those of you that read those scriptures and for those of you that led publicly in prayer. And, and we just kind of stood in awe day after day of, of how the different brothers would add a piece to the puzzle. And um, it, it's perfect because it was owned by God. It was directed by God. This is where the Lord has us. Um, uh, yeah, no other place I'd rather be. The Lord has heard the voice of my weeping. Uh, confidence. Boy, we can leave here with such joy. The Lord has heard the voice of my weeping. The Lord has heard my supplication. The Lord will receive my prayer. Let all my enemies be ashamed and greatly troubled. So my earnest prayer is that we would go home from this place with tremendous confidence in our God. Now, not the rashness of Saul, right? Not, not going home making rash vows, thinking that that is godliness, but just confidence, <coughs> maturity, steadiness, dependence on the living God. I keep thinking over and over of these great characters of Scripture. Moses spent 40 years in the, in the wilderness. That was part of the Lord's plan for him, right? I don't know what you're going to go home to. I don't know the Lord's timing. Do you think the Lord's timing was right in Moses' life? Right? We have the privilege of looking back. He ran ahead in what I would call like a youthful zeal, right? He spent 40 years in the wilderness. What must that have been like? I'm 40. My, he spent my entire life in the wilderness. So, so we, we can't go home demanding, Lord, it's been 20 years in the wilderness, right? Okay, it's time now. That wouldn't be wise, would it? But confidence in our God. Boy, the, the scriptures teach that. You think of Joshua. And everywhere your soul, the sole of your foot treads, I have given to you. No man should be able to stand before you, right? You go, yes. right? What a promise from the Lord. And you go in and you take Jericho. The walls fall down, yes. right? The great victories of our God. <clears throat> and then you go to Ai. Did they stand before the people of God at Ai? And you see Joshua brokenhearted as a leader of the people of Israel saying to the Lord, right? What do we say when the people of God turn their backs? It seems in that moment that it contradicted the direct promise of the living God to Joshua. So as we go home, boy, we, we expect, we expect the Lord's time to be perfect. We expect the victories of Jericho, we expect perhaps, I don't know if that's the best way to say it, I don't know if that's the best way to say it, a lot of things, but, but when, when the AIs come, we trust the Lord. And, and if it's appropriate to sit and to weep and to say, Lord, I don't understand this, what do we say when the people of God turn their backs before their enemies? And this seems to not fit with your promise, and we're not finding fault with you, but I don't know how to interpret what just happened, right? That's all good. We go through those processes in complete confidence in the Lord. The Lord has heard the voice of my weeping. The Lord has heard my supplication. The Lord will receive my prayer. I, I, I can joyfully say, I don't think I've ever felt more confident in our God than I do today. I know for a fact that I am where He has me to be by the infinite grace of God. And I know for a fact that we are where the Lord has us to be by the grace of God. And I'm so utterly... 100% confident that he will lead us forward for the glory of his name. We would all agree together that there's no reason not to have confidence that he will lead us forward, right? <coughs> so whether we're in year 39 of the desert, or whether we're in year 24 of the desert, or whatever, I mean, whether we go home immediately to, to a Jericho, is that a possibility? 
Sure it is, right? Or whether we go home and then there's an AI. Um, whatever the Lord's story for us, we have a story that's being written in North America. Oh, I love this land. And I love it. Boy, what a God that we can have confidence. Practical encouragement. Go to 1 Samuel chapter 14, if you would. First Samuel chapter 14, verse number 1. This is a, a wonderful, simple little story. 1 Samuel chapter 14, in verse number 1. Now it happened one day that Jonathan, there's character number 1, the son of Saul, there's character number 2, said to the young man who bore his armor, there's character number 3, Come, let us go over to the Philistine, garrison, that is on the other side. But he did not tell his father. And Saul was sitting in the outskirts of Gibeah under a pomegranate tree, which is in Migron. The people who were with him were about 600 men. Ahijah, the son of Ahitu, Ichabod's brother, the son of Phinehas, the son of Eli, the Lord's priest in Shiloh, was wearing an ephod. But the people did not know that Jonathan had gone. Between the passes by which Jonathan sought to go over to the Philistine garrison, there was a sharp rock on one side and a sharp rock on the other side. And the name of, the, of one was Bozes, and the name of the other, Shina, or Sina. The front of one faced northward, opposite Michmash, and the other southward, opposite Gibeah. Then Jonathan said to the young man who wore his armor, Come, let us go over to the garrison of these uncircumcised, that it, in, it may be that the Lord will work for us, for nothing restrains the Lord from saving by many or by few. How can you not love that little phrase in the Word of God? Uh, nothing restrains the Lord from saving by many or by few. Um, when I first wept over 530 million souls in North America, um, one thought that I had in that journey was, Lord, we're going to need a million evangelists. <laughs> and uh, it didn't take very long to think, oh, what a foolish thought. Um, and I just thought through what I, what I, the little I know of, of what God has done in the past. And, and with Jonathan Edwards and and um, Moody and Spurgeon, just these this handful of people. Uh, the Lord, there's nothing that restrains the Lord from saving by many or by few, whichever whichever He chooses. And boy, He has all the tools that He needs. Okay, so verse seven. His armor bearer said to him, "Do all that is in your heart. Go, go there. Go then. Here I am with you, according to your heart." Then Jonathan said, "Very well. Let us cross over to these men, and we will show ourselves to them." If they say to us, wait until we come to you, then we will stand still in our place and not go up to them. But if they say thus, come up to us, then we will go up, for the Lord has delivered them into our hands, and this will be a sign to us. So both of them showed themselves to the garrison of the Philistines. And the Philistines, or the Philistines said, look, the Hebrews are coming out of the holes where they have hidden. Then the men of the garrison called to Jonathan and his armor bearer and said, come up to us, and we will show you something. Jonathan said to his armor bearer, Come up after me, for the Lord has delivered them into the hand of Israel. That's confidence, right? What a joy. Yeah, how could you not like Jonathan? Uh, Come up after me, the Lord has delivered them into the hand of Israel. He's got two guys, right? Him and one other guy. I love that. And Jonathan climbed up on his hands and knees with his armor bearer after him, and they fell before Jonathan. And as he came after him, his armor bearer killed them. That first slaughter which Jonathan and his armor bearer made was about 20 men within about half an acre of land. I wanted to read just enough just to show that there was a victory, right? <clears throat> now, you could, you could keep going here, and Saul eventually sees that there's a, 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 a tumult going on, and, and he says, get the ark. Right? The idea would be he wants to inquire of God, and so then the ark is... The ark is coming, and then the tumult's getting worse, and then he says, hey, forget it, right? The, the fleshly king says, no, don't worry about asking of the Lord. Like, I'm just going to go. And you could talk about so many details, but I just want to look at three simple little things um, and have a very specific application for us here today. Uh, there's three characters in, in, this, in the story. And if you would, would you please ask the Lord, um, which one am I? There's Saul. And I want to think specifically about prayer. I don't mean generally in life. Specifically about prayer. Um, there's Saul, and he's sitting under a tree. 
The Lord knows I don't want to be hard on the people of God, but we've done enough sitting under a tree when it comes to the subject of prayer. He's just doing nothing, right? He's the leader of the people of God. You know, one thing I was delighted about in, the, in, this, in this week was the Lord brought a lot of leaders of the people of God here. I was delighted about that. Sorry. I was delighted about that. Now, originally, we, we were imagining one collecting point, and, and whether the Lord brought Gideon's little army or whether he brought 10,000 people, we kept telling him, we don't care. We want this to be what you want it to be. And the Lord directed through technology to have sites, uh, over 100 sites around North America where Christians would gather, and, and we're really careful how the Lord led. But the Lord still brought to this place leaders. And it'd be false humility to say, no, no, no. So many of you are leaders of the people of God in your spirit. So what are you? Well, the Lord knows I'm thankful that you're here. I don't want you to be so encouraged. I do not want to be part of the people of God. But honestly, in the subject of prayer, have you just been sitting under a tree? Whether you're listening at a satellite site or whether you're listening on tape at a later point or whether you're in this room, have you just been sitting under a tree? My firm conviction is that... Um, we have done a very poor job of leading the people of God in prayer. James 4 makes it so clear that, that prayerlessness is adultery. And we have to deal with the fact that if we are leaders amongst the people of God, and if we've been leading by default in prayerlessness, then the Word of God specifically shows that we have been leading the people of God in adultery. Boy, we have to deal with that. If that's the honest truth of it, and I'm speaking to men, I'm speaking to women. Everybody will have a sphere of influence here, right? Boy, I want this to be so encouraging. That's my earnest prayer, that this would be so encouraging as we leave this place. If you're a soul in your prayer life, in, in your leadership, if you're just been sitting under a tree, by the way, I'm not talking about the midweek prayer meeting, whether or not you physically attend the midweek prayer meeting. What an incredibly low standard. I know that that seems high to us, right? We're having a hard time getting up there, but that's an incredibly low standard. I'm talking about being a man or woman in prayer, and hence leading the people of God in prayer. So if that's you, boy, today would be a good day to repent. And just ask the Lord, you've shown me um, that I'm not like your son, and I just want, I want to say I'm sorry, but please forgive me. And I want you to please change me to be like your son. I don't care if you cry, I don't care if you don't cry, I don't think the Lord cares. But just call it what it is in His presence and be done with it. And then say, by your grace, would you please help me to lead in my spirit in this subject of, of prayer. Um, so you've got Saul, and then you've got Jonathan. Um, how could you not love? How could you not love Jonathan? Um, Saul's just sitting under a tree. Jonathan sees the body. We used the illustration this week of Eli, right? The foul man that no longer hears the voice of the Lord. And then Samuel, uh, he hears the voice of the Lord, right? Well, here you've got Saul, and he's just sitting under a tree. And then you've got Jonathan, and he sees the bottle right there. And he moves out into the bottle. That's some of you. That's, that's why many of you are here. I would guess that that's why most of you are here. You see the bottle, and you want to move out into the bottle. He says, come, come, let us go. Verse 6, come, let us go. Come, let us go. Come, let us go. Come, let us go. Over to the garrison of these uncircumcised. So, so if you're a Jonathan, if that's your heart, by the grace of God, of course we would be so quick to say that. By the grace of God, if that's your heart, then leave here with that little phrase, come, let us go. We go, go out into the battle. In this whole subject of, in this whole subject of, of prayer, he wants to fight the Lord's battles. And so we see, we see zeal, which is so good, right? Sometimes we associate zeal with youth, and sometimes we look at that, at that and say, oh, they'll grow out of that, right? Just give them time, they'll grow out of that. You realize when we say that, we're saying they'll grow out of Christ-likeness. I'm not talking about immaturity or youthful, misguided zeal. I just mean pure zeal. When we say, oh, they'll outgrow that, we're saying, oh, they'll become less like Jesus as they get older in their years in Christ. Zeal for thy house hath consumed me. I love the zeal of the Lord Jesus Christ. If he was here today, he would be, he'd be the most zealous person in this room. How could you not love that? 
about Jesus Christ. Jonathan is just a little picture of Jesus Christ in this story. He was the most passionate man in this room. Mature, steady, zealous, focused, dependent. Uh, what a beautiful example the Lord Jesus is and how Jonathan in this story is shining on him. Now it's not only zeal in verse 6. Come let us go over to the garrison and be uncircumcised. It may be that the Lord will work for us. For nothing restrains the Lord from saving by many or by few. Jonathan was headed out into a battle. He's going to attack. Right? He, he heads out. Right? He and an armor bearer, he's going to attack the enemy. Those are not good odds. Some of you are headed home into difficulty. I don't know most of your situations, but I know a lot of your situations. And some of you are headed home into great difficulty. And there may be AIs along the way, or there may be Jerichos along the way. Um, I, I would kind of guess there will be both uh, along the way. Um, but boy, look at the faith. He was zealous. But look at the faith. Nothing restrains the Lord from saving by many or by few. He put his confidence in the Lord. So Jonathan was characterized by zeal. He was also characterized by... Um, by faith. Um, and then there's armor bearers. And this is our third character that I, that I want to encourage us. Um, some of us wouldn't view ourselves as Jonathans, but we could be a helper to a Jonathan. Uh, look at verse 7. So his armor bearer said to him, Do all that is in your heart. Go then. Here I am with you according to your heart. Boy, that's good, isn't it? So you've got the Jonathans of the world. Praise God. You have the armor bearers of the world. Praise God. I had the privilege of being in a regional day of prayer. I don't want to say where, but a regional day of uh, prayer. And they decided to do it. I love the way they did it. They, they said, Scott, we want you to speak for an hour, and then we're going to pray for an hour. And then we want you to speak again, and then we're going to pray for an hour. And they set up the whole day that way, right? And we had around 120 to 130 people. And I know that this was the Spirit of God during the day. Um, the Spirit of God just moved in me. Um, and I was looking at the audience. And I said to them, during one of the afternoon sessions, I said, I said, I want you to ask yourself honestly, if this would only have been a day of prayer, how many of you would have come? So just honestly, try to think. And I said, okay, here's what's going to happen. Later. But it shows the heart, right? And I'm telling you that story for a simple purpose. When Jonathan said, let's pray, it says, do what's in your heart. I'm going to be there. That's incredibly encouraging. I'm with you. Do all that is in your heart. All oh, that's incredibly encouraging. So don't minimize that, please. Are there more Indians than chiefs amongst the people of God? Can you imagine if there were more chiefs than Indians? <laughs> Can you imagine what that would be like? You have 12 people trying to pull on the same Twinkie? <laughs> it would not quite go well, right? But when you have one guy saying, let's go this way, and an armor bearer is saying, do all that is in your heart, right? And that's God's design. So if you're an armor bearer, praise God, praise God. Amen. So, so don't, please do all this in utter dependence on the Lord and, and let Him lead you. Um, Ask the Lord, um, if you're an armor bearer, ask the Lord, who's the Jonathan? Immediately you can think of the elders in your local assembly, right? Love them, support them, pray for them that they'll become men of God, or that the Lord will encourage them as men of, sorry, I mean men of prayer. Or that the Lord would encourage them as men of prayer, whatever the case, whatever the case may be. Boy, just ask the Lord. That's been such a joy for me to ask the Lord to bring people in my life to pray with. And, um, and then labor, labor with those people. Um, we have to go home from this place uh, as Jonathans and as armor bearers, specifically the Jonathans that are here, we have to teach the people about prayer. I've been told so many times, prayer doesn't really work. These are by genuinely saved people. Prayer doesn't really change anything. Right? That's what they're saying. That's what the people of God are saying. Why are they saying that? <laughs> they're saying that because it's true in their way. And they'll tell you, I did pray it didn't make any difference when I prayed at all. Like, they came to the conclusion that they prayed, nothing changed, and they stopped praying. That's a hindered spiritual life. It's a hindered prayer life. The people of God need to be taught that sin hinders prayer. 
Husbands that don't cherish their wives hinders prayer. Pray, prayer and doubting rather than in faith hinders prayer. Prayerlessness hinders prayer. Selfishness hinders prayer. Where the people of God need to be taught. And then also not only taught, but they need to be led. I wondered about this. I wondered and wondered and asked the Lord, should I, should I charge the people of God to go home and lead? In this subject of prayer. And I have no doubt that I should charge the people of God. Based on behalf of Jesus Christ. The resurrected leader of the church. I charge you therefore in the presence of Jesus Christ. To go home and lead in the subject of prayer. Where do I get my authority for such a, such a declaration? The Apostle Paul. He led the people of God in prayer. Be serious about prayer. Devote yourselves to prayer. Peter. Actually Peter said. Be serious and watchful in your prayers. That Greek word means discipline. Self-restraint in your prayer. So Paul led in prayer. Peter led in prayer. Paul exhorted Timothy to lead in prayer. Right? It's everywhere in the Word of God. The Lord Jesus would have us go home and lead in appropriate ways. I don't mean arrogance. I don't mean rebellion. In appropriate ways. Whatever God has made you and whatever spirit the Lord has given you, lead in appropriate ways in prayer. I just want to say one little practical thing. Um, I don't know if this is the way it should be. It very well may be because of my weakness. Um, but one of the most, I think I'm understating that, but, um, probably probably the most helpful thing that I've ever experienced in the last decade in prayer, in terms of my coming along in my relationship with prayer with the Lord, has been praying with, with other brothers. And so I just wanted to throw that out there. Um, if the Lord, this didn't happen all at once, it happened very slowly, but there are five men that the Lord has placed in my life that I pray with every week in the will of the Lord. Now, we'll miss plenty of weeks, right? I'll be quick to say that. Like, it doesn't always work, but but we have purpose in our hearts, right? I have a Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, and then I have two guys that, that are floaters, right? We pray whenever we can make it work with our schedules. But that discipline of prayer has been incredibly beneficial. Now, there are hours, hours upon hours of practical tips that we can say, um, but I just want to throw that out there. So are you a salt? If you are, let's just let the Lord change us. The Lord showed me I was a salt in, in terms of love for the lost about five years ago, and I just had to repent with tears and ask the Lord to change me. Boy, he's so faithful to make us like his son. Are you a Jonathan? If so, boy, go home and lead the people of God in prayer. However the Lord gives you to. Are you an armor bearer? Boy, we need way more armor bearers than we need Jonathan's. So whatever the Lord has made you, praise God. Let's go home with confidence in our great God.